Uh, having said that, uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, I think Valentin yeah, doesn't require any introduction, I guess. He's brought to us lots of interesting uh, features, including the, the caching that he will talk about. And uh, yeah, Valentin, take it away. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Frames, again for this fantastic talk. I think um, I'm glad to have it, because then I can skip over other things that I otherwise would need to explain. So uh, if you're just coming in, I'm sorry. Um, so my talk today is about compiler plugins and non-native caching. And I'm going to start at the back and um, end with compiler plugins. So if you remember this slide from last year's State of JuliaCon, we managed over the last couple of releases to greatly reduce latencies. Primarily, time to load and time to first X, which is our lovingly name for you know, this desire to get a cup of coffee the first time I start Julia in the morning. Um, nowadays, uh, time to first X is massively reduced. Um, and that's fantastic. How did we manage to do so? Well, very in, the beginning, in, in the beginning of the world, when Julia was very new, we had a concept called system images. So I went back and I looked at when this was introduced. System images are essentially um, a serialized state of a bootstrapped system. And this is a common thing in Lisps. So we load a program, we run some code, and then we white out the state of that program, and then later on we reload that. And that's what a system image is. Um, Jeff added this in 2014, 12, 13, you know, very early on. It's a part of 0 0.1, so it, there was never a world where we didn't have this. But even in the beginning, system images did not include native code. Native code is a machine code that your machine will actually execute. It's object files, um, stuff like that. So um, this was added two versions later. So this was added by, Jeff, uh, by Jamison. Um, you can look at the pull request. It's a long discussion. And at the end, everybody is like, oh my god, everything is so fast now. Julia is actually usable. Um, great choice. But we didn't have the same thing for packages. So in the beginning, Julia, old Julia code was in Julia. And then slowly, packages started to emerge as a concept that people wanted to have. And the packages became bigger and bigger until they became the behemoths that is now the differential equations ecosystem, or Maki. And so in 0.4, Jameson added the first notion of incremental compilation for packages. And it's the same notion. We, we start a fresh Julia process, we load all of the dependencies, and then we run code, and then we save out the change. What changed during this process? And that's called a pre-compilation process, and that's what Julia is doing while you're waiting for the progress bar to finish. Um, but this did not include machine code. It only cached the state that it was generating. So it took a couple of years maybe 10 or more. Um, in 1.9, um, Tim Holy, Jamison, and I introduced uh, package images, which are essentially um, incremental compilation caches with machine code attached to them. And we needed to rewrite um, the serializer. We needed to figure out how to do this in the first place. And it was an interesting journey to get there. So just to give you a little bit of a terminology, uh, when we talk about functions in Julia, we're talking about the name. It doesn't have any methods yet. So if you just type function, function solve end, you introduce the name solve as a thing in Julia. That's the function. Then we attach to those functions methods. Those methods um, have a type signature, and that type signature is used for dispatch. But when you then actually call that uh, method, we take the signature of your call and we specialize and we look up which method to actually call, and we call that a method instance. But we're not done yet, because that method instance is valid as long as the method hasn't been redefined, but other things might have changed in the system. So we have a fourth concept, which is called a code instance, which says this instantiation of this method instance is valid in these worlds. Um, and here's a function pointer you can call and jump to and execute this code. So basically, we have a four-stage process to um, look up, going from the name that you typed in with the 
uh, arguments that you passed in to then actually finding which function pointer to call in the system. Um, I'm glossing over this. This is basically what Frames was talking about earlier. Um, and we have tools to work at the levels of compilation. So if you want to look at what code is being executed by a function, you can use an edit in there which to find out what actually is being executed. You can work with macros. You can look at the output of macros. You can look at the lowering process. We have um, typed IR. And as people mentioned, we have generated functions. We have cassette passes, all of that fun things. Um, and then at the LLVM level, we have LVM.gl, so you can um, generate your own code because you're targeting this newfangled vectorized processor that nobody else has ever targeted before. Um, and then at the very bottom, LVM.gl actually provides a SM, a SM call. Please never use this. If you really need to use it, come talk to some of us before. Um, also, never look at code native. Um, always look at code LVM. You don't have an Intel processor running into your, in, in your brain, and the, the code is confusing anyway. Um, but when we zoom in, we actually, as Frames mentions, we have a little bit more of a complicated story. We don't just have one typed IR these days anymore. We have uh, three, four. We, uh, depends who is counting. So we start at the linearized IR, which is the IR that um, has not yet any type information attached to it. It's just your program as you have written it, but it's made it slightly easier for the compiler to understand. Then we run type inference over that. We start annotating this with types. Then after that, we now prepare the IR for optimizations. We translate the data structure from code info to IR code. That's what Frames was talking about earlier. And we can start munging about and hammering on it. And we have a whole host of optimization passes written in pure Julia. And we hope to write more optimization passes in pure Julia on that level. And then we will finalize that typed IR so that the compiler, the LVM code generator, can con understand and consume it. That's the output of add code typed. And then we pass it to LLVM, and LLVM does things with it. Oh, we pass it to Cogen. Cogen generates LLVM IR. And then LLVM optimization passes run, and so forth. So why package images was a great success, and why we have this complicated and um, sophisticated Julia compiler, we ran into an issue that code that was supposed to be running on the GPU was not being cached. And it sounds like, OK, maybe you're running like a couple of kernels. That's a couple of seconds per execution. Uh, is that really a problem? We did a Gordon Bell attempt uh, two years ago, which is basically trying to run uh, the biggest number of floating point operations on a supercomputer possible. And our startup time was roughly 13 minutes. If you multiply that by the number of machines involved, you end up in a crazy world where you spend weeks of your compute allocation, weeks of compute hours just compiling GPU code. OK, so why can't we just do the same thing again? Right? We, we figured it out how to do it for the CPU. Why can't we just figure it out for the GPU? Well, um, the part of the issue is that GPU compiler talks to the underlying infrastructure, but the underlying infrastructure is not necessarily meant for GPU compiler to exist. So we always work at the boundary of what is technically feasible and at what is advisable. And most of the time, we are away from the advisable and do new things and try to get um, this infrastructure working on this ever-changing uh, software platform called Julia. Um, one of the primary things that we can't do is we can't leak inference results or op uh, optimization results into the native cache. And that's also true for what Frames was talking about. It's a big no-no to apply a custom transformation and then leak it to the compiler and just be like, ha, your assumptions are still true. Please execute this code, and uh, I don't want you to crash. The compiler will probably crash. Um, so uh, a master student of mine, Colin Warner, uh, spent a year long experimenting with how could we integrate these systems. And the big issue he ran into was the fact that we are doing incremental compilation and we are filling these caches incrementally, but then we need to serialize them 
And that serialization process was very tricky because you need to figure out what existed before, what existed now, what is the difference, and write only out the difference. But we have an incremental cache. Okay. It's built into Julia. So why don't we just use that? Well, um, we, the, the pull request we uh, merged last fall um, introduces a new field to code instance called owner. And this owner is just a token. And that token bifurcates the cache, and you can use it to look up into that cache and say, I want uh, the compilation result just for this abstract interpreter, for this GPU compilation, for this whatever I want uh, as a transformation. Um, and with that change alone, we went to, uh, we improved compilation times by quite a bit. So um, on the left side here, the um, red numbers are if you just run in the REPL on either 1.10 or 1.11. And this is where you know if you sum this up, it's 13 minutes or something like that, and it's ridiculous. This is an ocean simulation. It has a lot of different small GPU kernels. If we actually use uh, package images and do pre-compilation with Snoop Compile, um, the situation improves dramatically, but we are still talking about you know, more than a minute to actually get going. And then, um, and then when we enable the GPU cache, we uh, slice off a good chunk of that time. We go from 69 seconds to 44 seconds, um, uh, which is a good improvement, but uh, the question is, can we go lower? What are we spending our time now on? Um, this is a little like a side. If you're wondering how to do this, you can actually use package extensions, which is new, to um, also um, compile GPU code. So you can define a package extension that depends on CUDA, and then when only CUDA is loaded, you can say, if CUDA is functional on this machine, also run uh, the pre-compilation workload and warm it up for CUDA specifically. It's a very neat way of making sure that you don't depend on CUDA in your main package, and you only add it uh, and necessary capabilities in later when needed. So the on this cache is a, a pull request that originally was written by Tim and then rewritten twice in the meantime, and was flying around. It was very experimental. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to save machine code as well. But because we have many different versions of GPUs around, it didn't feel right to bake it into the package image itself. So instead, we are writing out small files into the scratch directory that contains the necessary assembly so that if you're changing options or flags or you're changing GPUs, you can still cache it. And you do, um, the next time you execute, you, you don't get a cache miss. With that improvement, we went from like 44 seconds to 12 seconds, which basically is acceptable. It's still not perfect. Um, I think there are some things we can do. But um, also very important for me was that like, these time steps is where the actual GPU code is being run. And this third time step is when we're actually executing the model for the first time, um, as we will for all time steps from now on. And so that went from like 3.6 seconds to 0.02 seconds. So basically, the overhead of compilation went away entirely. So. Now switching tact, going back to uh, talking about what Frames was talking about earlier, uh, compilation and compiler plugins. We have this very powerful tool in the ecosystem called Cassette. And if you've played around with, um, with transformations, you might have encountered it. And it's been starting to bit rot, and it's not, <sighs> there are issues with it that are hard to fix. And so the question is, are there better ways of fixing it? Um, I understand Cassette as primarily a tool to apply code transformations. Other people see it as a tool to do other useful things. But at the core of Cassette is a code transformation engine. In order to do so, it uh, transforms all calls that look like f of arcs to a call that overdubs context, comma, f of arcs. This um, allows users to run code transformations, similar like if you were to take um, add code lower, extract the code, and start um, uh, editing it manually. But Cassette confuses Julia's inference engine, because now every call looks like we are calling overdub, which we'll call overdub, which we'll call overdub, which we'll call overdub, and add infinity. So it looks like it's a very recursive program. And we have um, heuristics that say, 
this is too recursive. Slow down. We, we don't want to run our inference engine for um, the rest of uh, the heat death of the universe. Let's stop here. So we fixed this um, very early on by introducing this beautiful hack that is called method for inference heuristics, where you say, hey, by the way, yes, this looks like you're calling overdub, but actually you're calling f of arcs. It's beautiful. It's a hack. We should not do this. Um, it also relies on generated functions. And while generated functions are very powerful, they have an Achilles heel. Generated functions only work on concrete type signatures. So if you have an abstract type signature, the generated function will not run. You will not, your generator will not run, and we will not generate IR, and inference says, oh, you know, this is any. And it sounds fine, because, I mean, is an all interesting code um, uh, uh, statically inferred? But actually, it turns code that used to infer well and turns it into code that doesn't infer well anymore. And so it can ruin inference on user code, and it can ruin things like pass or rand. And suddenly, you're in a world of pain that you can't recover from anymore. So Closing over this, this is frames basically talked about this. Uh, we have this notion of an abstract inter interpreter. It's a bit of a misnomer. Abstract interpretation is the technique that inference uses. An abstract interpreter in Julia is an API to modify and extend our compiler pipeline that includes abstract interpretation, but not only. Um, this is probably hard to read from afar. But uh, there is a recent pull request that I was fiddling about, which uh, shows an example how to modify the abstract interp interpretation engine uh, in GPU compiler to add support for um, deferred calling uh, and basically introduces a custom um, uh, intrinsic for GPU compiler to do some uh, uh, challenging transformations. Um, so somewhere in November, I, I couldn't sleep, and uh, as one does when one doesn't sleep, one goes onto Twitter and posts bad thing, thoughts. <laughs> so I just had implemented scoped values, and it was uh, I, I started to enter the era of um, everything I need is a scoped value anyway, so what can we do with it? If you want to know more about scoped values, I have a talk in a little bit about them. Um, and so I was like, couldn't we just you know, implement the compiler as a scoped value. Well, then I implemented tag, tag code instances to solve the GPU compiler cache problem, and now we have this handy owner field on our code instances that we can use to do cache lookups. And then it was end of November, and I co still couldn't uh, let this thought go, and uh, in some conversation with Kano, I was like, really? We should just do this. Well, there has been a PR. Um, up on uh, GitHub that uh, if you were intentionally avoided the word compiler plugin or compiler instance or you know customization of compilers entirely, and I just called it support execution of code from external abstract interpreters. What Frames was talking about is you run your abstract interpreter and you get this object and then you stuff it into an opaque closure and you feed it back into the compiler and trust me, this is okay. So can we do this a little bit more formally? Can we customize compilation um, on a scoped level? We don't want to do it globally. We all have experienced how global uh, flags can turn uh, to ruin very quickly. Um, so the core concept is very simple, almost uh, trivially. So each task, which is the Julia unit of code execution, Takes a f it gets a new field, which essentially is a scoped value, but implemented as a privileged one, because we need really fast access in the places where we don't have scoped values yet, like in C. Um, and that carries a compiler instance. And then we use that compiler in the, uh, instance as the um, value that we store into the owner field of a code instance. And so when we do a lookup, when we search for the compilation result, we say, look at the current compiler, search in our cache for the entry that is correct for that current compiler. It has a very minimal API. Uh, you can get the current compiler, 
you can construct an abstract interpreter from a current compiler, because abstract interpreters are ephemeral. They come and go, um, as do those. Um, you can get a compiler world, and I'm not going to talk much about this, but that's a fascinating concept to freeze the execution of your code, to not have to uh, re uh, in big invalidation pauses when you start messing about with things. And then the core um, primitive, which is invoke within. So you, you give me a compiler, you give me a function and its argument and its keyword argument, and I will switch contexts, and it will execute within that compiler. Um, so how does this look like? like these are examples taken from the pull request. Here I might want to implement um, uh, a common use case for cassette, which is to replace functionality. So uh, let's say I have a function sign, and I want to change it to uh, the function cosine because I feel evil. Uh, so I want, my, my, I want to define an overlay, and so we have these method tables that allow me to define these kinds of transformations. But now I want to execute with my new custom method table where I have put all of my, my tricks into it. Um, so I define a compiler uh, that now carries the method table. Um, I define a new abstract interpreter, which is what you need to do, in generally speaking. Um, I tell the system how to construct that abstract interpreter given my compiler. Um, and then I tell um, the uh, system, by the way, when you're looking for the method table for this custom interpreter, well, this is how you construct uh, the method table to use as a lookup. And so here we now construct an overlay method table uh, that uses this overlay that we have defined. Um, and then at the top, we have this overlay function, and that's what the user could see. Right? The user could come with a method table, pass it in, construct my compiler, and that works. Well, it almost works, but it works to the first abstraction. So what other compiler plugins could I uh, construct that are useful? Well, one thing that's very powerful is optimization passes over typed IR. So when I'm prototyping a new optimization pass, and that might be loop invariant code motion, global value numbering, anything else that is currently like flying about, it might be very useful to go about and generate a new compiler plugin and be like, hey, by the way, you can just install this package, and you can try out my new snazzy optimizations. Um, I have an example for multi-line fusion, multi -line, um, that will come up in a little bit. I could do tracing. I could instrument every call and say, I want to capture all the arguments to this call, wipe them out in some data structure, um, and when this uh, function returns, I want to capture that return as well. Um, one big caveat is we don't have context arguments like in cassette, but what do we have? Scoped values. Scoped values are great context arguments. Um, so problem solved. Um, one thing that I haven't implemented yet, but which I would want to do with the system, is to implement scope bounds check elision. Uh, so that you don't have to set globally bounds check equals false, but you can say in this subgraph of the program, turn off bounds checking. So multi-line fusion is something that works over untyped IR. And why? I will talk a little bit why about we need untyped IR here. Um, so we have a program that uses podcasting, and it does like a dot times b and c the dot plus a. Now, because in Julia, uh, podcast fusion only happens over statements, these two lines separated in each other could be inefficient. So in IR, in untyped IR, this code looks like this. And this is where I disagree with frames. This is actually the entire semantics of the program, and everything else is accidental. Um, so now I want to turn this into this, which is basically C is no longer created. I removed the materialized call, and instead um, the podcasted in statement four now takes uh, the argument in one, and that is valid. But that is only valid to do before inference, because podcast, as it is defined, uses inference in sense of allowing customizations on the user level. And so those customizations might change depending on the tree of operations that is being presented to the user. So if I do this after inference, the user has no option anymore to customize this correctly. So 
one challenge of compiler transformations is do we do before or after inlining? In the beginning, I was like, hey, let's do everything after inlining. That makes my life so much easier. Except when you then realize that the uh, code that you're inserting, you're now inserting 17 times. Julia does bottom-up inlining. So we inline functions coming from the leaf nodes of the program upwards. So if I'm applying my transformation after inlining, every time I'm applying these transformations over the entirety of the inline graph. And so we get a combinatorial explosion of instrumentation if you're doing instrumentation. So do it before inlining. Um, when I'm inserting instrumentation, I was like, oh, I just insert this call to this new function, you know, instrument. Well, now inference will come and visit that, will run my pass that instru instruments that function, and now I'm instrumenting instrument with instrument. And afterwards, I will instrument instrument with instrument because instrumenting was not good enough yet. Uh, and you also get fun recursive loops that nobody wanted. So you can change that by just saying, okay, I'm now inserting um, an invoke within. I'm switching back to the native interpreter for this particular um, uh, call. Everybody wants to work on typed IR or maybe even LVM IR. And uh, some wise person once said, don't do that. That's not correct. Uh, and I have to agree with that wise person um, who may or may not be in the audience. The problem is, what is semantic Julia code? Semantic Julia code is the code that you are written and you're running, and it may run unspecialized. Your inference may never see your code. Your optimization pass may never run. And so if it's important for you to the correctness of the program that your, um, uh, that your, that your transformations are applied, because otherwise they're semantically wrong, like Automatically differentiation. You can't do it over typed IR because there might be environments in which typed IR is never executed. It's only untyped IR. Um, so the most reliable is to do tran um, uh, transformations upon IR lookup. And so there is an uh, extended interface to the abstract uh, uh, compiler interface to basically customize that. And this is a more powerful ver version of a generated function. Um, and I'm out of time. So um, one idea is we could use this to actually customize a lot more about Julia. So we customize the bindings, the methods. Um, we could execute this in the same Julia progress, separate instances of code by separating the compiler instances. Um, the PR exists. It's up there. It compiles. It kind of works. It's stale. I need to rebase it on current master. This might never land. This is a proposal. It hasn't been decided on yet. I'm putting it out there to see if this is what we need or if this is not sufficient yet. So if you want to work on this, talk to me later. All right. Let's thank Valentin for the great talk. Are there any questions? Uh, I don't know who raised the hand for us. It was close. Maybe Oliver. I'm not sure. <laughs> So if tasks then basically replace the compiler with, with a new compiler, and, and I guess this will propagate to tasks they start, Yes. how will this layer or compose? That's a great question. Um, it doesn't. In contrast to what I said, it doesn't compose. You could, in theory, um, the problem is you have multiple levels to expand. And so it is unclear which level. So on the untyped IR, we could do composition. On the typed IR, composition becomes very hard. But you could write um, a compiler plugin standard lab on top of this that has uh, pass orderings um, that you can register passes with, and that way you could do composition. All right. Uh, OK, maybe a quick one. <laughs> very clear. Yeah. Hey, Valentin. Um, would it be useful if untyped IR was in SSA form? 
This is um, almost in SSA form. I call this SSA form with memory. Um, I think that is sufficient. I don't think we, we, we do need linearized IR. We don't want to do expression trees. But I don't think we need full SSA form. All right. I'm afraid I could take your question. There will be plenty of time to, to uh, ask Valentin. Let's thank the speaker again.